Okay, good evening, Rabbi Tai. Tonight we're going to talk about a very important and crucial subject, which was the seven mitzvot of the Bnei Noach, of the Goyim. They have the seven mitzvot that they're commanded to do. So just to give you a little bit of a background, how does this work, right? So the way it works is that when, when Adam Arishon, the Rambam says, when Adam Arishon came to the world, the Lord Baruch Hu gave him six mitzvot. Commanded him six mitzvot. So what happened was that uh, when Noach came to the world, and after the flood, they added to him one more mitzvah. That's the idea, right? Which one is that? Which one did they add? Ever minachai. What does that mean? A, live, a limb of a living animal. Not allowed to eat that. Until the animal dies. What does that mean? Cut off as the animal is alive. You cut off his leg, you know? And you eat it. This is not allowed to do, according to, right? according to Torah. We learned that already, right? We learned that, yes, yes. We talked about that. So this issue is something that applies both to the Bnei Noach, to the Goyim, and also to the Jews as well, this prohibition. But there are differences, by the way, between one and the other. It's not exactly 100% the same thing. We're going to talk about that. So what happened was that Noach was commanded seven mitzvot. And then, right, as time went on, later on, Abraham Avinu, when Abraham Avinu came, by the way, you should know, right, the Chazal say, there was ten generations between, between Adam Arishon and Noach, ten generations, there was 10 generations also between Noach and Avram Avinu. Altogether, 20 generations passed by between these two, these three people. Right? It's a long time. We're talking about like, you know, th- uh, more than a thousand years. Mm-hmm. Right? That's the idea. So what happened was that Akadosh Baruch Hu now, he gave also mitzvot to Avram Avinu. What was the mitzvah that gave him? Milah, right? To do circumcision. This was something which was given to Avram Avinu and his descendants after him as well, his family after him. Uh, and he also, right, instituted, the Chazal say, he instituted also the mitzvah of uh, praying shachrit, or saying, saying the morning prayers. This is also something that Abraham Avinu instituted. Then Yitzchak instituted the afternoon prayers, the mincha. And then Yaakov instituted the arvit, the evening prayers that we just did now. That's the idea, right? And then Amram, it says in the Rambam here, we're going we're to discuss that, who was the father of Moshe Rabbeinu, and he was the Rosh Sanhedrin. He was the he was the head of the high court in, in in Egypt. There was a high court also over there. So what happened was that he was also added some mitzvot, Amram. And then what happened was that after that Moshe Rabbeinu came and he gave the whole Torah to the Jewish people. Right, six hundred thirteen mitzvot. This is the idea. This is the way. This is the way it all originated. The history. So what happened was, as you know, right, that the Midrashim say the Gadot, the, uh, the these uh, right uh, in the Talmud also we find this. The Kadosh Baruch who came. When he gave the Torah to, to, to the Jewish people, beforehand he came to the other nations and offered to them, and they all refused it. That's what happened, right? So, you know, there's an Agadah, there's a Midrash like this, right? They say that the Bnei Esav, right, asked, them, asked Hashem, right, what's in the Torah? What do you want us to accept? So it says, Don't, do, do not kill. They said, no, we were commanded, you know, not commanded, but we were blessed by, to be lived by the sword, you know, so we're killers, you know what I mean? So, you know, we have... We have 18 people murdered in Chicago, you know, every weekend, you know, over there, shot, whatever, whatever it is, right? In Baltimore, we have uh, over there, right? In New York City now, right, we have a, a whole big mess going on, right? With this, this uh, Debilacio, right? The new, uh, the new old, uh, right, the communist mayor that we have, all these kinds of things. The blacks so, are also part of Esau? Huh? The blacks are also part of Esau? Uh, so the, word, the way it goes like this, right? They're not really part of Esau, but the way it works is like this. Esau was offered, so Esau said no. Then he offered it to Ishmael. Right? Ishmael. He came to Ishmael and offered it to him. He told him, do you want the Torah? They said, what's in it? He said, don't steal. So they, we said, but we're thieves, you know? Like, we, you know, we like to grab everything. You know, if you talk to people in Israel, they're always going to tell you, right? That you better watch out. If you've got, like, workers coming in, you know, those from them, guard your possessions because it'll be gone before, the, before, you, before you turn around, it'll be gone. Right? That's the idea. I remember one time, you want to hear something really funny? One time it was so bad uh, I, 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 I witnessed this myself. What happened was that uh, I was sitting in, in the kola, in the yeshiva of Maran, you know. I was sitting over there and eating a lunch, you know. They had a lunch, they had a lunch room over there, a kitchen, you know, whatever. So we were sitting there eating lunch. And what happened was that uh, one of us was eating dairy and one of us was eating meat, you know. Yeah. So the rule is, according to halakha, that you have yeah. to separate these two places, areas, right? So you shouldn't come to eat meat and milk together. So you've got to make some kind of a heker, some kind of a recognition. So what I did was I took off my watch, you know, which was like a cheap Casio, you know, you know, like $20, $20 watch, $15. I 
and I put it on the table. And there was a guy, one of those uh, guys over there, working over there, you know, cleaning up. What happens? I turn around and the watch is gone. Yeah, what? I said, my God, you know, who took it? I look at him, I said, oh my God, look at this. So I told him, I said, where's my watch? You know, I, 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 I told him, prison, yeah, you know? Yeah. And he got scared, you know, he knew that he was gonna, you know, was gonna get in trouble. Yeah. So he returned it, you know, he put it back. Uh -huh. Can you imagine such? He grabbed my watch, a little Casio watch, you know, I had it on the table. This is the way they are, these people. There's another funny story. You wanna hear another funny story? They say, right, that uh, they talked one time, they interviewed in some magazine, the, the, the pilot who used to fly around Arafat. Arafat, you know, Imak Shemo. He had a, uh, a private jet that was given to him by the king of Jordan or somebody, whatever. It's one of those, uh, you know. So he used to fly around the whole world. What happened was that, um, uh, you know, they, they interviewed the pilot who was an American guy. They, they said, well, no, what did you see like with these Arafat, you know? What did you see? He says, oh, he says, you know, I want to tell you a funny thing. He told a few stories, but one of them, he says, you know what it was? They said that every time they would like, we would stop off, you know, go to a hotel, whatever, lodge somewhere, they would steal the towels, you know, and bring them to the, uh, you know, to the plane. And they would say, oh, you know, we got away with it. You know, they bring the, over the suitcases and show, the, show off the towels, you know, that they stole from the, from the, from the, <laughs> this is the way they are, you understand? This is their, uh, they can't help. This is, <laughs> right? Bakol, it says right in the Pasuk, right? Their, their hand is everywhere. Okay, that's the idea. So anyway, the point is, right, that they didn't accept the Torah. So the, all the other nations are under the wings of Esav and Ishmael, you know? They are like the leaders of the going. 35 nations are under the wings of Esav, 35 nations under the wings of Ishmael. So therefore, they're all really concluded in like one category, in the sense that they all rejected the Torah, all the nations rejected the Torah. So what happened was, the Baruch Hu told them like this, okay, you reject the Torah, fine. But at least you got to keep the seven mitzvot, you know? Those seven mitzvot that I commanded to Noah, his sons, you got to keep those at least. By the way, what's the point of this? You know, I mean, in other words, if, if, if they don't want to keep the mitzvot, so then why give them, if they don't want to keep all the mitzvot of the Torah, why give them seven mitzvot? What's the point of that? What, to give them like a consolation prize? You know, like, a, you know, something like that. What kind of thing? What's the pur pur what's the purpose of it? Well, if they're going to be in coexist with us in society, yeah. I mean, they have to keep some sort of a, 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 a moral code. Right, that's the idea. <laughs> you know, pretty much what you're saying is right on the right on the money. What does that mean? It says in the Rambam the reason why that they're commanded to keep the seven mitzvot is because otherwise the world will be like totally corrupted. You know, like it'll be totally destroyed. Like just like we have today. You know, New York City, Minneapolis. You know. This is what, you know, uh, uh, lawlessness. You know what I mean? Uh, anarchy. That's what it is. That's what we have to do. Because there, nobody's keeping the mitzvot. This is the idea. You know, this is the reason why. The, nobody, you know, the, these looters, you know, going in, taking whatever they want, you know, take a home, a prize, take a, a prize home, and you go home. This is the way it's supposed to be. So, this is the reason why Kedosh Baruch gave the seven mitzvot to the Bnei Noach. Why is that? Because otherwise the world is going to be totally destroyed, mutilated, you know? This is the, they have to keep it because to keep the world just not because we want some we expect some high spiritual plateau from them because they don't have that. But the point is right just to you know to, they, they shouldn't eat one another alive. You know what I mean? Respect each other, respect each other's property, respect God. You know on some basic level, don't curse God. Don't you know? It's Isn't kind of that thing. why yeah. in a way Rambam says that uh, in a way it's good that uh, they got. Uh, Yeshua, because... We're going to talk about that, by the way. We're going to talk about this they, issue. Because if they did it, yeah. they would just be, remain pagans and... and uh, right. The, the truth is that uh, that's a whole issue in itself, right, to this whole uh, discussion. But the truth is also, but, you know, on the other hand, well, on the other hand, that, on the other hand, not exactly the way, what maybe the way you think, but on the other hand, right, what's the, what's the bad thing about this, what they believe? You know what I mean? The bad thing is, th this is exactly the point I wanted to mention. The point is, right, the Gemara says... That even though the Hashem gave the seven mitzvot to the goyim, they don't keep it. You know, even the seven mitzvot they don't keep. Some of them keep. Maybe you know, maybe I don't know. Maybe one percent, maybe two percent. I don't know. Whatever you know, something like that. Yeah, like you always said, they are they are righteous gentiles. They are righteous gentiles. Yes, absolutely. One percent from seven billion—that's a lot. 
Right, it's a lot, but still, you know, I mean, since most of them don't keep it, they're considered they don't keep it. Guys, I'm sorry I'm standing by sciatica. There's also another issue, which yeah. is what? The issue is, the Rambam also mentions this. He says, the question is, why do you keep it also? That's also. Mm -hmm. Do you keep it because you believe that it's coming from God? Or do really you keep know. it because it's logically, you know, it makes sense to you? But that, you know? But they know about the Anakha. But do they know? That's a different, we're going to talk about that too. But this, the question is what, what they know, what they don't know. I think uh, it's right? a combination of both. They, yeah. they worship God. Yeah. You know, the ones that keep it. Yeah. And they also know that, that, that it's a moral code that keeps them in check. Right. Yeah. But the point is like this, right? That the Ramam says if they keep the mitzvot because they think logically it makes sense to them, that's not, that's not good. They have to keep it because, not because it's logical or it makes sense, because God commands you to do so. That's all, you know, don't ask questions. Hashem, you know, tells you to do something, you don't say, oh, no, if it makes sense to me, then I'll do it. If it doesn't make sense, I'm like, what, are you, what are you talking about? What? Well, you have to judge, wait, who judges who? He judges you or you judge him? Yeah. You know, who judges who? I don't think it's That's the only, question. I don't think it's only about the going, it's also about Jewish like this. Absolutely. Absolutely, but well, we're talking about... You know, how did the, over there, the rednecks always say, God expects us to... to right, him, right. You know, so they have to do it yeah. because of that reason. Yeah. Not because they say, oh, you know, yeah, it's logical, I believe that, you know, it's, it makes sense, you know, because if you steal from one another, if you kill each other, right, the society, society cannot exist. This is not the reason why you should keep it. The reason is because God commands you to do so. This is the reason. If he does th that because of that reason, then he gets reward for that. You know, that's the, that's the thing. But says so the Gemara, nevertheless, they don't keep the mitzvot. In general, right? If one percent keeps, right, that's not called keeping. You know what I mean? We're not going according to the minority. We're going to the majority. The majority doesn't keep it. So what does that mean? So it says the oh, Gemara. The majority don't keep it ours either. Uh, it says in Gemara like this, right? That because they don't keep it, because they don't keep it, you know what Kadosh Baruch did to them? He did to them a real, uh, pretty, uh, pretty nasty uh, move. What did he do to them? He took uh, the mitzvot away from them. That's what it says in Gemara, right? In other words, you don't keep it? Okay, fine. I'll take it from you. So the Gemara asks, what does that mean he took it away? What, now they can do whatever they want? Is that what it means? So Gemara says, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about they, they can do whatever they want. They're still liable if they don't do. But the difference is, now they don't get you as much reward as they would if they would have kept it. What does that mean? Now, HaKadosh Baruch took it away from them as an obligation, as if, what does that mean? That... You know, when a, when a person is not obligated to do mitzvah and he does it, he gets less reward. Yeah. So the, because of that, they get now less reward as if they were not commanded, if they keep it. So Kadosh Baruch Hu, just because they don't keep it, so he did also to them, you know, like, uh, when, you know. When did he do this? Huh? When does it say he did this? Uh, the Gemara, it says, right, that uh, pretty much, you know, they never kept it. I mean, that's pretty much the story. You know, so it was, it was, uh, it was right away when they, when they received it. They never kept it. So... The point is, right, that what happened was the Kadosh Baruch Hu took it away from them. Once he saw they don't keep it, the exact moment, I don't know, it was, I don't know if it was uh, 230 before BCE, I don't know exactly what it was. You know, I cannot tell you exactly the, the, the point, but he, he realized that they don't keep. So once he realized they don't keep, he took it away from them. What does he took it away? They get less reward as if they were not commanded. But if they don't keep it, they get punished. So they get, you know, the, the raw end from both sides. You understand? This is the, this is what, it's, what it says in the Gemara, right? But nevertheless, they still have to keep it, you know? So, because of that, we have to understand uh, what they have to keep and how they have to keep. And also, we have to understand what the difference is between our mitzvot and their mitzvot. Because the question is like this, right? How do we consider their mitzvot? Is it like they have seven and we have, then we have like 600 13. and 613. So, minus seven, that's 606, right? So, is that like we have 606 more? from them, or is it like totally a different mitzvot altogether? You know what I mean? In other words, are our mitzvot, are they additional to what they got, or are they a different group altogether? This is also something which has to be understood. So the truth is that, that both true. In some ways, it's an, it's an additional thing. And in some ways, it's different also. It's not exactly the same as their mitzvot. Even though we're both commanded like on things like theft, you know, and idolatry, but their command is not the same as ours. They have we have different standards, different ways of looking at all these uh, issues. So therefore, we want to understand, right, what, uh, what all these issues, how, how, they, how they come practically to fruition. So says the Rambam like this. 
I want to tell you his language here. Moshe Rabbeinu lo inchila Torah mitzvot ela l'Israel shenema morashat kilat Yaakov. So he says the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu, he only gave the Torah, the whole Torah, 613, to the Jewish people. He didn't give it to the Goyim. There are the way some people today, they think that the Goyim also received the Torah. They didn't receive the Torah. They, they refused to receive it. That's what happened, right? So the Ramam tells you only the Jews received the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu only gave the Torah to the Jews. So what is this thing over here? There's a pasuk, right, which proves that. So it says, So he says, whoever wants to also convert to Judaism, So he says, whoever wants to also convert to Judaism, he also has a portion in that. You know what I mean? If he wants to convert, he also becomes a part of that game. That's the idea. And then it says, But whoever doesn't want to keep the Torah, we don't force him to keep the Torah. We don't tell him, listen, you know, you're not Jewish? Okay, you got to be like us, you know, put on tefillin and keep Shabbat. We're not gonna, we can't tell him that. He's, he's a goy. You know what I mean? person has to understand that. This is, you know, ABCs, fundamentals. We're not, we cannot force them to keep our mitzvot. But their mitzvot is a different story. Their mitzvot, if we had a chance to force them, we should. That's a different issue. So comes and says the Rambam further. Uh, says the Rambam also, right, that Akadosh Baruch also commanded that if we have the power to enforce these laws upon them, we should. Meaning what? We have to set up like, you know, courts and help them to set up the courts in order to enforce these laws. Today we don't have the power to do that. You know, but if we did, we should. Because why? So says the Rambam, because otherwise the world is going to be destroyed like that, you know, corrupted. Like, you know, De, De Bilasio, his New York, and, you know, Minneapolis and Los Angeles, what's going on there, right? Rioting, looting, all kinds of things like this. This is the, this is the way the world should be. Like, lawlessness and anarchy. This is not the way it should be. So therefore, right, Moshe says, says the Rambam that this is the reason why we have to force them to keep these laws. If we could, if we have power to do that. Why? Because otherwise the world is destroyed. There's no, there's no society like that. Anarchy. Very good. So says the Rambam in the next chapter, which is in the Laws of Kings in uh, chapter 9, uh, right, Perek Tet, it says, Shesh Arayot, it says like this, Makeda, Al Shishat Vanim Nitzavu Adam Arishon. So he says there were six mitzvot that were given to Adam Arishon. So what were those mitzvot, according to Rambam, right? Uh, this is uh, according to the Talmud also, obviously. Everything comes from the Talmud, right? All what, pretty much all which the Rambam wrote comes from the Talmud. It's a, it's a tradition, you know, that we received. So uh, he says that the six mitzvot that Adam Arishon was commanded, right, as, as follows. Uh, number one, Abu Dazara, right? They're not, you cannot do idolatry. Have other gods, you know, this kind of thing, right? This God, that God, you know, as we said, right? They have many gods. Yeah. You know, the Indians have these gods so and the Chinese. The religion they yeah. practice is forbidden for them, in a way. Well, yeah, we're going to get to that point, by the way. The point is that uh, right, really, they're not really, they're not really a, a, allowed to practice another religion. The, that's the because it's, it doesn't come from God. It comes comes from some you know some homosexual priests you know who used to molest children. You know, you what, you want to do what they tell you. That's what you want to do. Well, those priests <laughs> you know? came into play late. They're I mean, the ones who made this religion. What do you think? Who, who do you think made it? Jews made this religion. Not really. The, the current religion that they have today was not made by Jews. It was made by homosexual priests, so the blessed children. No, but his <laughs> disciples were Jews. Yeah, but they're, they're not the ones who made this religion that they have right. today. They didn't make that. They, all the most, all, most of the things they have today comes from those homosexual. So what was it before, before, uh, before this? I mean, uh, what, wait, what was it? Uh, no, in a way, it's, uh, you always tell yeah. us that. Uh, he built a church, basically. He converted. Right, but his church was not the church of the Catholic Church. Okay. There was a big difference, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's the idea. So he still preached the Torah. He was a heretic, you yeah. know? But the heresy of the of the Roman, you know, church yeah, is much, much greater and much, much bigger. The bigger, yeah. much, you know, it's a so, total distortion. So what did he preach? Does it specify? For, for instance, we're not interested in what he preached, but, no, but, but what, what, the difference is like, for instance, you know, like they, they're the ones who said you should rest on Sunday, not on Shabbat. You know? right. This was a Roman that. thing. He never said that. This was a Roman yeah. thing. Yeah. All these crazy things that they made up, right? You know, with the trees and all these kinds of... This is a Roman, this is all Roman... So compared uh, to them, yeah. he was still a proper Jew. Not a proper Jew, but he's, you know, he, was definitely, he was definitely not so far off. Right. By the way, you should know that, you know, you should know in history, one thing you, you can prove. 
that when, when Jews go, like, deviate from a religion, it yeah. starts slowly, you know, and then it gets greater and greater, mm. and it totally deviates altogether, right? It becomes, branches off altogether. Yeah. That's what happens. It starts sort of slow, you know, first of all, you become, like, you start to cancel this, start to cancel that, and then, sooner or later, you know, you find out, like, you're in a totally different area altogether, right? You know, this is what happens. So, the current religion that they have today is a pagan religion, basically, based on pagan principles, you know, and it's a mixture of all kinds of things. But basically, it was made by homosexual priests, you know, who molest children. That's what it is, right? That's that's their what their religion comes from. Okay, so believe me, <laughs> I tell you. That. <laughs> okay, so um, again, as, as we go on, right? So they're commanding on idolatry, the also cursing the name of God, cursing God, also spilling blood, bloodshed. They're commanded on that as well. Right? And also on promiscuity, all kinds of promiscuous things. We're going to get into the details of, by the way, what's forbidden and what's permitted and so forth and so on. The Allah Gezel, also on, on theft, right? They cannot steal, you know? Right? Crime doesn't pay, you know? <laughs> you remember that, right? Mr. They used to call it, what is that? The Man of Steel. He used to call it the Man of Steel. <laughs> okay. The Man of Steel. Okay, so. Uh, and the dinim, also, they're also commanded another one, which is the dinim. What is dinim? What does that mean? They have to set up courts which enforce these laws. They also are commanded on that. And this is considered to be, by the way, a very important law. Because otherwise, if you don't enforce the laws, you really don't have nothing in your pocket, you know? You're pretty much empty. You know, you're running on empty. Oh, yeah, I suggest we do it. Okay, if you suggest. Who's going who's gonna to listen to you? Right? You've got to have, you wait behind your, your, your laws. What does that mean? Courts officers, you know, punishment, you know, all kinds of things like this, execution, right? We're going to get to that issue. Uh, so that's the way it works. So this is also one of the mitzvot is to have judgment that judges these kind of things. Very good. Um, so then he says, we're getting into a little bit more details, right? So what are we talking about? That a, a goy, right, a non-Jew who, who serves idols, Idols means he's serving a different god, you know, like not 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 the god of Israel, a different god. You know, that's the idea, that's the idea. When you serve a different god, you're an idolater. So uh, he says like this, right? Ben, what what's the punishment? Um, he's he's liable to death on that, right? All these all these seven mitzvot, by the way, that they have, they're liable to death if they, if they break them. Right? That's the idea. So it says like this, uh, but that's only he's liable to death only if he serves it the way that it's served. In other words, if he serves in a way which, which they don't serve that idol, so he's not liable to death, even though it's forbidden, the Rambam says, it's forbidden to serve in any way, but he's only liable to death if he serves it the way that it's supposed to be served. That's the idea, right? Every idol has, every idolatry has some kind of a service that they do to it, you know? This is the thing. So if they do it the way that it's supposed to be done, according to their judgments, according to their laws, right, according to their customs, then he's liable to death. Uh, so it says like this, right, that so he says the rule is that every Avodah every idol, idolatry, which the Jewish court will kill a Jew on that, also the Goy is supposed to be killed on that as well. That's the general rule, right? Uh, and as we said, that even though if he does it in a way which is not the way to serve that idol, nevertheless it's forbidden to him, but he's not liable to that. That's the difference. Okay, next one, right? He curses the name of God, right? He curses God. So it says... Whether he do, curses God with a name, a special name of God, right? Which is, you know, the ones that are in the Torah, you know? Adonai, Elohim, you know, these kinds of things, right? If he uses those names, or he just says God, you know? He's liable to that too. Why? Because God, in the English language, you know, that's what it means. It means God, you know? It means Hashem. So therefore, right, even if they use that language, they're liable to, to, to with that as well. But not so with the Jews, by the way, right? With the Jews, says the Rambam, they're only liable to curse God's name if they use a special name of God. But if they just say God, you know, they're not liable on that. So here, the laws of the Goim are more stringent than the law of the, of the Jew. And in some instances, that's the way it is. Okay, it goes on the Rambam, right? And he talks about uh, a Goy who killed somebody, right? What's the rule? He, he also has to be killed. Execution, right? So it says, um, even if he killed what? Uh, a fetus, right? Meaning what? Abortion, according to the laws of the Goim, Abortion is a li liable to death. A person who performs an abortion is liable to death. Because he killed a fetus, right? So therefore you see from there that abortion is murder. You know, not like what they say today. Oh, it's my body. It's true. It's your body. It's true. You're the mother. It's your body. 
but you're killing also life inside your body. You know, uh, just because it's inside your body doesn't make it free to kill him. That's the idea, you know. So therefore, if if a goy kills uh, aborts, does abortion, you know, those doctors who do those, Kavorkian, you remember Kavorkian, Kavork, yeah, Kavork. Yeah. So anyway, right? He's liable to death. So uh, that's the idea. Um, also, right, if he killed somebody, he was already, like, you know, sick, you know, very deathly ill, you know, on his deathbed. He's liable on that too, even though he's going to die. Even if he was, like, you know, in a dangerous situation where he's about to die, let's say the animals are going to eat him, he killed him first, he's still liable on that. Right? Another thing is, Something amazing, right? He says, Mashin can be said, that there is also another rule with the, with, the, with the Goim. That let's say, for instance, somebody was chasing you, right? To kill you. So what's the rule regarding that? Right? What does that mean? If somebody comes to kill you, get up and kill him first. You know? But says says the Rambam, now that's the guy is also allowed to do that, right? If somebody's chasing him, he's allowed to kill him as well, obviously, you know, to, in order to save his own life. But the difference is that he's, he's allowed to save his life, but if he can do something to him to, to neutralize him without killing him, let's say shoot him in the leg, you know, so he has to, he has to do that, right? So, right, we see from there, by the way, that, uh, you know, what happened with that officer? You remember that whole story with Atlanta? You know? So the truth is, right, that that cop... If he could have, you know, neutralized him by shooting him in the leg, he should have shot him. He should have shot him, shot him dead, Absolutely. according to what we're saying. Yes. Technically, even yes. though it's a very difficult case, by the way, because the guy had a weapon, you know what I mean? He had a weapon. He shot him in the back. Right, shot him in the back, you know, but it's definitely not, you know, no. such a clear-cut case. No, no, but... Uh, you know, whatever, but according to what we're saying over here, but the truth is that not always it's possible, by the way, to shoot somebody in the leg, you know? You have to be very accurate. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a whole discussion. You know, it needs to be adjudicated, this... What happened over there? You know what exactly what what I mean, took place? The, the country is burning down because of it, and you shoot another one this time in the back. You know, let him go. You know where he lives already. He's drunk right now. You know, surprise him at three o'clock in the morning. Knock on his door and arrest him there. You know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't burn, yeah. you don't put you know more fuel on a burning. I see what you mean. You know, listen. You know, I see what you mean. I'm, I mean, I'm talking yeah. about that specific. Right, right. No, I understand you. Listen, it's uh, you, have, you have a strong point. You know, what can I tell you? But still, you know, it's not such a clear-cut case. It's not. It's because not the, the guy had a weapon. You know, he was, he was, he was firing it on me. You took your weapon. You don't take a policeman's weapon. Who does that except them? Yeah, I know. It's, it's ridiculous. Like, what did you think? You're going to get away with it? What, uh, what are you going to do? Run to, run, to, run to the Bahamas? What are you going to do? You notice no, that it was a mistake. we're burning down because yeah. of this. It happened so many times. It's going to keep happening. And not one message from either one of these corrupt... People. They're enjoying it. Instead of coming out and telling them, <laughs> yeah. people, this is not going to end until you stop resisting the cops. Yeah. Whether you're guilty or innocent, don't resist the cops. Do what they say, and nobody will get killed. No, they're, they're just the opposite. They're enjoying it. They're enjoying every second. And then they're riding the wave, too. They're riding the wave, you know what I mean? To get benefit from it. Yeah. To benefit from it. Every single one of them. Very corrupted, very corrupted. Every single one. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, so, uh, as we said, um, but when it comes to a Jew, says the Rambam, it's not like that. What does that mean? He's not liable all these types of, all these types of murder. He's liable on murder, obviously, but not all the types that we just mentioned over here. Right. So, some even want to say, by the way, that shows you that even though abortion is also forbidden for Jews as well, not only for a goy, it's a bur- forbidden to do abortion, also for us it's forbidden. But, but from here, some, some commentators want to say, that it's forbidden, but he's not liable to death, the Jew, for doing abortion. Uh-huh. As opposed to a guy who's out liable to death for that, right? Even That's the difference. A yeah, it doesn't matter, you know. That's not, doesn't, the fact you have a license, you know, to, license to kill, you know? <laughs> you know, right? So, that's the idea. Okay, that's... I guess that's why, uh, what's their name? are still alive. Uh, a couple of them that we have in the community. <laughs> the aborting babies, like, uh, you know. Ah, really? I wasn't aware of that. Well, we have a couple of gynecologists in the, in the Georgia Right, right, right. Shem Yachem. Oh, if they were doing that, oi, oi, oi. Oi, oi, oi. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> um, well, they all do it, right? Ah, God, God. Shem Yachem. Shem 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 Sh
there are six relatives, right, forbidden relations that are not allowed to marry these people, the, the goyim. Right? With the Jews, it's even more. But with the goyim, so who is that? Right? You're not allowed to have relations or to, to marry uh, your mother, right? Mother. Mm-hmm. And also the, your uh, husband's wife. Let's say, you know, he had a different wife from a different, you know, not your mother. You know what I mean? Veshet Ish, also a married woman, right? Also, to Goy, it's also forbidden to have, to have relations with a, goy, with a, with a married woman. Ve'achotome'imo, and also, right, if, if his sister from his mother's side, not allowed to have relations with her, right? even to a Goy. Ve'zachur, also to males, right? Homosexual, you know? That's also forbidden to Goy. Ubehema, also animals, right? Bestiality, that's also forbidden. So all these six things are forbidden to Goyim as well. And they're also forbidden to Jews, obviously. Right, as you know. And the, but to Jews, there's even more. Uh, he's bringing him here from the verses, right, and from the Torah, to, to learn out these prohibitions. Because they're not written so specifically, you know, like explicitly, but they're like alluded to, you know, in the Torah. So he's bringing you the verses over here to show you how it is that all these things are forbidden, are forbidden to a goy. That's the idea, right? Um, very good. Also, another thing the Rambam adds is that a goy is also liable if he goes with a woman that was seduced by his father or raped by his father. Let's say his father raped that lady. He's not allowed to be with her anymore. You know, because they had some relations. If he raped a lady, if he he seduced a certain lady, and because of that they were together, that's it, right? No more, they're not allowed to be with that lady anymore. It's the son. That's the idea. Okay, that's the technicality. Okay. So he says also regarding homosexual, right? Um, he also says, right, that regarding the wife of the, of the father, he, it's like a stepmother, you know? He's liable even after he dies. Not allowed to be with her, even after the father dies. Then it goes on, right? What about males, right? What about homosexual? So it says the Rambam that they're liable on homosexual whether they had relations with a grown up man or even a child, whatever it was, right? Doesn't make any difference. Except there's one difference, right? If he had relations with a child, with a boy, so the boy's not going to be killed. Why? Because he's not old enough to be punished. You know what I mean? He's just still a child. But the man who did the relations is going to be punished because he's, he's old enough. So one of them will be killed, the other one will not be killed because he's not old enough. What's the age, by the way, that he has to be old enough? It's, it's 13, like Bar Mitzvah, you know? That's the idea. Once you become Bar Mitzvah, you're liable. So Bar Mitzvah also applies to the Goyim as well. And it's to a certain sense, right? They don't make a bar mitzvah party like we do, but we're talking about, right, the issue of being liable to, to punishment. So they're also liable once they reach the age of bar mitzvah. That's the idea, right? Okay. Let's go on. Not like 18 that they have over here, right? 17, 18 they have over here. In most states, whatever, or 21, whatever it is. Certain things. Okay, very good. Let's go on. Also regarding bestiality, right? That if he has does bestiality, the man or woman is killed, but not the animal. The animal we don't kill, right? It's different when it comes to a Jew, right? Because with a Jew also we kill the animal as well. The animal that did that, we kill him too. But when it comes to the goy, we don't kill the animal, we just kill the person who did it himself. Very good. So it goes on the Rambam. Also, he says, right, that if a, if a goy commits adultery with somebody else's wife, when is he liable? Only if he does it the regular way, right? What does that mean? Not from the back, from anal. Right? If he does it anal, he's not liable to death. It's forbidden, obviously. But not liable to death. But if he does it the regular way, he's liable to death. Not so with a Jew, by the way. A Jew is liable in both ways, right? Whether it was anal or normal, he's liable anyway. Why is that? Because when it comes to a Jew... Anal intercourse is also called intercourse. This is the difference, right? So therefore, the Jew is liable on that case, but the Goy is not liable. Right? So we have different different rules, different strokes for different folks, as they say, right? That's the idea. Yeah. Very good. Different holes for different folks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> right. Um, also, right, he says that he's liable as well, on a betrothed woman, right? And let's say, for instance, also, um, that's only if he had relations with a, with a goyish woman. 
with a non-Jewish woman. What about if he had, did adultery with a, non, with a Jewish woman? So over there, he's liable even if he does it the, the anally. Why is that? Because the Jewish woman applies anal also. So therefore, he, if he does it with a Jewish woman, he's liable in both cases. That's the idea, right? So different thing. Right? Different, different, different rule for each one. Um, so he says, right, also, um, let's go on. So the question is like this, right? Uh, first of all, let's, let's see what he says regarding uh, the other mitzvot. Uh, he says, also libel on theft, as we said. So what is called theft, right? Even if he stole anything, right? Some items, some money, whatever it is, any issue like that. Also, if he, if he kidnaps somebody, right? That's also called theft. You're kidnapping a soul, kidnapping a person. Like kidnapping, you're thieving, stealing a person. That's also called theft. So if a person steals somebody, kidnaps him, abducts him, you know, he's also, God is also liable on that. And this is the reason why, by the way, that a guy is also liable to death on rape. Why is that? Because in order to have relations with that woman, right, to rape her, you're like stealing her body. You know, you have to keep her, hold her down, you know, and you're, you're, you're stealing her. Especially if you abduct, abduct her, take her to a different place, so forth, so on. So therefore, right, a guy, why is he liable on rape? Even though, let's say, the woman is not married. She's, let's say she's a single girl. He's still liable to death on that. Why is that? Because he stole her. You know, it's a matter of theft. And this is the reason why he's liable right, on, on rape. And this is exactly what happened with Dina, right? The daughter of Yaakov Avinu. Shem, right? This guy kidnapped her, he raped her, right? And th- therefore they killed, they killed him because of that. They killed off the whole city because of that, right? So the reason is, the question is like this, right? Why did they kill, kill off the whole city? It was only one person who did the rape, right? So explains the Rambam. The reason is, is because uh, the other ones didn't object. They knew that Shem, who was the son of the mayor of the city, he did that, and they didn't object. So therefore, what were they liable on? They were liable on not having dinim, not, not having a court system that enforces the laws. So therefore, they beca- all became liable because of that. The, ones who, the one who did the act, did the act. The one who didn't do, didn't object, right? The, the, the ones who did not do. So therefore, they all became liable. And this is the reason why they killed off the whole, the whole city over there. Even though Yaakov Avino didn't like what they did, when he said it was, a, it was a mistake what they did. But nevertheless, technically speaking, what they did was correct. That's the idea, right? Okay, very good. Uh, then we go on. Um, as we said, right, the guy is also hi- liable on a, a living limb. Before the animal is killed, he takes a living a limb, limb off the body and eats it, right, whatever. He's liable on that to every minachai, right? A, a living limb, a, a, a limb of a living animal. So regarding that, the, as we mentioned before, right, in one of the classes we mentioned, that's different from the Goy of the Jew. Not the same. The Jew is also liable on that, eating a, a living limb. But the Goy, first of all, is liable to death on that, number one. The Jew is not. But second of all, there's a different issue there, which is that what? That um, the Goy is going to be liable. Let's say, for instance, we did Shechita, right, on the animal. We shechted it. We did a slaughter, ritual slaughter, like the Jews do. How do Jews do ritual slaughter? They cut two pipes, right? The windpipe and the food pipe on the neck, like this, right? They go like this, they cut both, the two, two pipes on the, on the mammals, on the birds they only, you can only do one, you don't have to do both. Not necessary. The birds have a lighter, have a lighter obligation. So the way it works like this, right, that let's say the Jew, right, cut the animal's neck, and now it's like, you know, in the throes of death, right? It's like, you know, jumping around, just about to die. Death pangs, right? It's getting de- de- death pangs. So if it's getting death pangs, the rule is that the goy, if he eats the living, living limb of the animal at that point, while still like moving around, the, the goy is liable or not. The Jew is not. Why is that at that point the, goes, the Jew is not liable? Because once he slaughtered him, and since according to ritual slaughter, the, it's considered to be dead, the animal is not going to live. Right? So therefore, even still jumping around, jerking, it's like jerking around, it's still considered to be dead for the Jew. Why? Because for the Jew, ritual slaughter is what makes it dead. So therefore, the Jew is not liable at that point, but the goy is. Why is that for him? Ritual slaughter is, is not really something which they're commanded to do. So therefore, they have to wait till it's totally dead, the animal. That's the idea, right? It's not moving at all. No more jerking. No more, no more uh, jer- uh, jerking around. Okay, very good. Let's go on a little bit. Right? Uh, the Rambam says some very interesting things over here. Uh, so he says, regarding having a court system, right? How are they commanded the, the Goim to have a court system? What's, what's the commandment? So he says like this, right? They have to have 
courts in every place, right? Every area, in every right uh, uh, city or whatever state, you know, every, every everywhere there's a community over there. They have to, in every uh, uh, so they have to have a, 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 a like their like set up court system everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then he says, right, that the the point is of setting up the court system is what to 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 uh, to enforce these six mitzvot that they have besides this mitzvah to enforce them mm-hmm. and to punish on them. This is this is the whole point of the of the court system, right? Um, so he says, right, that if, if a goy goes transgresses any of these mitzvot that we mentioned, the six mitzvot that we mentioned besides these, he's liable on that. Well, how do we kill the goy, by the way? Because there's four types of death in the Torah, right? There's there's um, stoning, stoning right? There's burning, burning, right? And there's beheading, as you said, right? The sword, and, and then there's uh, there's burning, and and there's also strangulation. Right, that's the four deaths that we have. So the goy in general, he only, he only, he always gets the the, the sword. This is the this is the way the goy is killed. Uh, but the Jews have three more types of deaths that they get, depending on the sin that they did. Right, it's it's all variation of. Who carries it out? I'm sorry. Who carries it out? The court once they make the verdict, then they go out, you know, to that place with the execution chamber, yes. you know, and they they carry it out. But well, we did we did away with that. Not that we did away with it, we just don't have the, the, the system today system. because it got you know got nullified because of the exile. Because of the persecutions that we had, you know, from the Romans and all these kinds of things. Okay, whatever. Uh, so as we said, um, they have to they have to so he says like this, right? Um, So he says, right, also there's a big difference between the Goyim and the Jews. When it comes to the, the Jews, if you want to judge a capital case by, the, by a Jew, you know, to, to, to execute somebody, you need 23 judges. And at least two witnesses you need. Two credible witnesses, right? With the Goyim, it's not like that. You need one judge and one witness. Right? So it's a much, much faster process, you know? You can... You can uh, you can do it much faster and much easier. So it's not the same thing, right? Even though we have the same laws with respect to all kinds of things that we mentioned, but the the punishment is not administered in the same way. This is the idea, right? But he says, nevertheless, though, even though they all, they only need one judge, they don't need like a jury like they have today, you know, jury and all kinds of deliberations, you know, with the jury. They don't need that. It's something that they made in America. That's a newfangled thing that they made up, right? That's the idea. Um, so it says also there's another difference between the Goy and the Jew, right? When it comes to the Jew, in order to execute him, we have to warn him first. What does that mean? Two witnesses had to warn him. This is forbidden what you're doing, and you're going to be killed because of that. And he accepted it. You know, he said, oh, I don't mind, I don't care. I know, I know, I know that. If he says like that, we kill him. But if he doesn't say like that, we cannot kill him. If he didn't warn, we didn't warn him, he didn't accept the warning. When it comes to a Goy, he doesn't, doesn't need warning, Right? So but whether, whether he was warned or not warned, if you have one witness that says that he did it, and one judge who believes it, right, he buys it, that's it, that's over. That's, that's the, the uh, right? And also there's another difference between the Goy and the Jew. That what? That you're not allowed, to, when it comes to the Jewish system, you're not allowed to have witnesses that are related to each other, relatives, you know? You and your cousin, they, yeah. they come, you know? Mm-hmm. Or also the judges cannot be related. And also the judges cannot be related to the... Uh, to the, to the defendant either, right? No, no relations between you, one and the other. Can you call Johnny Cochran to defend you? Who's that? Who's that? The, uh, the black guy who defended OJ. Ah. <laughs> the dream team. The dream team. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The juice, the juice. Yeah, the juice. Okay. He put a lot of juice on that guy's body. Yeah. 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 A lot of red juice over there. Tomato juice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, as we said, right, that uh, it's not the same thing. Uh, but also he says another thing, right, which is what? That even though they can have witnesses that are related and all kinds of things like this, but regarding one thing they cannot have, right? They cannot have a witness who's a woman or a judge who's a woman. Not allowed. The judge has to be a man. Also the witness has to be a man. Two, 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 two different things, right? Uh, okay, very good. Let's go on a little bit. The Rambam goes on further, right, to describe the, the laws of the Goim. It says like this. Uh, so regarding, right, before we go on, just wanted to explain one thing. That we, we mentioned 
that in the Gemara it says that they, the, the Goyim did not accept the seven, seven mitzvot. So instead, right, what do they do? They say, oh, you know, Yeshua will forgive me, you know. This is the biggest corruption that there is, right? Do you understand? A person becomes a total denier. Tonight he does a sin, tomorrow he goes to confession, you know what I mean? And Yeshua will forgive him, you know. You're forgiven. There's no bigger corruption than that, you know. So in, in, one, in one sense, it's true, you know, that these religions that they have brought them out of paganism, you know, to a certain extent. That's the one thing. On the other hand, also corrupted them. What does that mean? They believe that everything is forgiven. They can do anything they want. And tomorrow I go confess and everything is forgiven. You know? So this is a total corruption. This is, this is not allowed to do, by the way, what they do. You understand? It's a total heresy. You believe that you can sin tonight and tomorrow it's gone. It doesn't work like that. But the truth is that, you know, in one sense, a person should repent. What does that mean? Let's say he did a certain sin, right? And nobody saw him, you know? There's no witnesses, no nothing. So what is he going to do? What, give, give, uh, go, go and give in himself or confess? We don't for, by the way, we don't forgive him that's, if he confesses. That's a brilliant thing yeah. that you just brought up because yeah. all the, these years I've been meaning to ask you, if a person confesses, uh, does a sin, yeah. something bad, yeah. bad, and there's no witnesses except right. God himself, Yes. are you obligated to give yourself up to the authorities? So the rule is like this, right? Interesting. That self-admission is not admissible in Jewish law. You cannot convict yourself. You understand? So therefore, right, if you come and say, oh, I'd kill somebody, you know, we, we cannot do nothing to you. What if you can't live with the guilt? What's the reason why? That's your problem, you know? You should, you should, you should, you should uh, repent. You know, do teshuvah. Okay, you, know? you can repent, but you can't undo what was well, done. cannot undo it, but anyway, there's repentance, right? Yeah. You can do teshuvah. But you know what's an interesting point? The interesting point is that what's the reason? The Rambam explains why don't we, we why don't we accept a self confession of somebody? Somebody comes and says, "I sinned. I did this. I did that." Why don't we accept that? So you know, the Rambam says something brilliant. He says the reason we don't accept it is because a person sometimes can go wacko, you know, a little bit, you know, lose his mind, and he comes and says something which is not true. Well, I'm not saying you know what I mean? uh, to a holy court. Uh, no, no, it doesn't matter. We'll do. You know, you go to a yeah. police station. Yeah, I understand. There but the guy could go. be wacko. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of wackos in the world. And they'll come and tell you something. They're hallucinating, you know? Yeah. They have hallucinations. But what if, what if they you know? prove it? What if you prove it to them? There's nothing to prove. You need another, another witness. You know what I mean? If there's another witness, that's proof. You know what I mean? Circumstantial evidence is not admitted mm-hmm. in, in Jewish law. Like only witnesses are admitted. Mm-hmm. You know that, right? It's a very important thing to understand. That's I'm going to tell you something about that, by the way. Something really interesting about that. But nevertheless, right, what I'm telling you is that self-confession is not accepted. So it says the Rambam, it could be that the guy lost his mind. It could be also, by the way, that he's suicidal. Another thing the Rambam says. Yeah. What does that mean? The guy has a death wish. He wants to die, you know? So he comes and tells people, I killed somebody. They should, they should execute him. And this is the reason why we don't believe a person like that. Suicide by cop. You know what I mean? <laughs> we don't accept self-admission because of these reasons. That's what the Rambam says. Okay, interesting, right? Interesting. Uh, yes. Uh, whether it's a Jew or a Goy, by the way, you need, you need to have witnesses. As we said, with, with a Jew, you need two witnesses. With a Goy, only one is it. Only, you need only one. You don't need two. That's the idea, right? Let's go on. So, it says, right, that now the question is like this. Let's, okay, now we're talking about that the Goy is liable to all these things. But what about if he did it without, without knowing? He didn't know what he was doing. So what's the rule? Is he absolved? Is he patur? Or is, is he obligated, the Goy? Right? So for the Jew, right, obviously he's absolved. He has to know what he did. If he doesn't know what he did, he's definitely not chayav. He's not obligated. He's not, he's not guilty. But what about for a goy? So says the Rambam, depends on how he didn't know. What does that mean? Let's say, for instance, right, he went to a woman, he had relations with a woman, and he thought that this was uh, his girlfriend, you know, he thought this was his wife. Turns out that it's his mother. You know, it was dark, he was drunk, you know. Turns out that he had relations with his mother. So what's the rule, right? So says the Rambam, he's absolved. Why? Because he didn't know what he was doing. He thought that was, that was his wife. He thought that was his girlfriend. You know? So it's allowed. He's, we don't, it's not allowed, but we don't kill him. That's the idea, right? But there is also another type of shogeg, which the goy is liable. What does that mean? He, the goy cannot say, oh, you know, yeah, I, I know I did that. You know, I had relations with my mother, but I thought it was permitted. You know? This, one of you asked about this, right? So what, what happens then? Or let's say he, you know, he killed somebody. He, he thought, you say, you know what he tells you? He says, I thought it was permitted to kill. I didn't know that it was forbidden to kill. 
I thought Yeshua will forgive me tomorrow. I'll go to confession. Yeshua will forgive me. You know, huh? What's going to be then? What's the rule? So there we kill the goy. You know, if he says like that, what's the reason why? Because he's supposed to learn these laws. They're obligated. So that's the thing, right? The goy is obligated to learn the, the seven mitzvot of Bnei Noach. If he didn't learn them, that's his. That's his problem. We don't accept that. That's not considered a claim by us. We don't accept that as a claim. You understand? So therefore, in a case like that, if a guy tells you, oh, I didn't know, I'm sorry. I didn't know that, it, that idolatry was forbidden. You should have known, too bad. It's your, that's your problem, you know? But that's not accepted. But with a Jew, it would be accepted. What does that mean? Until the Jew was warned by somebody that this is forbidden, and he told him, yes, I know. I don't care about that. Until that point, the Jew was absolved. To, to death from the earthly court, right? What they're going to do from above is a different story. I'm talking about the earthly court, right over here. That's the idea. Okay, so that's the idea with the goy. Okay, very good. Let's go on. Another interesting thing, right, which is that when it comes to a Jew, there are three cardinal sins that a Jew is liable to give up his life for them. What does that mean? Let's say if somebody comes and forces him to do it, tells him, you know, puts God into his head, says, listen, if you don't do this, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll kill you. If you don't do this. What does that mean? If you don't kill somebody, I'll kill you. If you don't do idolatry, I'll kill you. If you don't bow down to Yeshu, I'll kill you. Right? Or if you don't do, right, if you don't do adultery, I'll kill you. So what's the rule over there? So the, the, guy has, the Jew has to give up his life on that. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this is considered to be, like, you know, three cardinal sins. That a person has to give up his life on these things. So, what's the rule with the Goy, by the way? Does he also have to give up his life? If somebody comes and tells him this, if you don't kill that guy, I'll kill you. If you don't do adultery, I'll kill you. If you don't do idolatry, I'll kill you. So over there, the guy is not is he, he's not liable on that. If he, if he wanted to kill somebody to save his own life, why is he not liable? What's the reason why? So the Rambam says very good, very very logically, right? He says because the goyim, the reason why we have to do this is to sanctify the name of God. You understand? But the Goy is not obligated to sanctify the name of God. Kiddush Hashem. We're obligated. They're not obligated on that. Understand? So therefore, there's also another difference between the Goy and the Jew that we're not, they're not obligated on Kiddush Hashem and we are. So therefore, we have to give up our life on those three things, but they do not. And that's the idea, right? Not another difference between the Goy and Jew. Okay, very good. Uh, another interesting thing the Rambam says, right? What about if a Goy converted to Judaism, right? Becomes a full-fledged Jew, you know, and then comes back two weeks later and tells you, listen, you know, uh, I regret what I did. I want to go back to being a goy, you know? Like, uh, so what's the rule? We tell him, no, it's too late. I'm sorry, you already converted. You can't go back anymore. And once a person converts kosher, there's no way to go back. Even if he goes to church, you know, and bows down to the cross, he's still a Jew. You know? Yeah. Once you did a kosher conversion, there's no going back. You understand? So therefore, the Rambam says, we don't allow him to do that. If he, and if he tries to do it, we tell him, no way, you know? We'll, we'll, we'll punish you for that. Don't think that you're, you're a goy. You're not a goy. Yeah, but if you converted yeah. to a Jew, yeah. but your heart is not there. And, you know, it's you true, but what happens is, you know what it is? Your heart may not be there. You may be right. It's yeah. true. But what happens is that when a person converts to a Jew, he gets a Jewish soul, and Neshama comes down. That's it, you know? Mm -hmm. You cannot take that back. Once it comes, it never leaves. Yeah, but what if you don't keep the... the, the, the so you become a Jewish sinner, just like, you know, all the other ones. Join the club, right? <laughs> that's what you were talking about before. Right? Join the club. That's, the, that's why we don't want to convert people like that, you know? If we, if we, if we, if we see that they're not genuine, we just tell them, you know, that's not, not for you. We're only taking serious people. You know, people who are really dedicated, devoted, right? That's the idea. Very good. Um, also, another thing, right, which is very important to know, what about if a young child was converted, right? We talked about that last week, you know, with uh, our friend, right? We talked about that. So what happens over there? Sometimes they, adults convert, and they want to also convert their children as well. So they just take, put, drop everybody into the mikveh, you know, one after the other. Pach, 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 pach. Right? The whole family goes in. But the problem is the child is not yet really intelligent, you know? He's still a kid. Yeah. So he didn't really do it willingly, you know? So what happens... Can you convert somebody without without his willing uh, accept, acceptance? 
So the rule is like this, right? The rule is that when you convert a child, when he becomes bar mitzvah, he can still reject it. He can say, you know what? I'm not, I don't want. He has a chance to reject it at that, at, that, at that moment, when he becomes bar mitzvah. That day. When it's his 13th birthday, he can say, I don't want. If he, if he doesn't do that, he stays a Jew. You know, even if he tells, try to do it later on, you know, age of 13, 14, 15, you know, later on, too late already, right? Once you accepted it at, the, at Bar Mitzvah, that's it. So that's the only, the only chance that he has to reject it is that day of the Bar Mitzvah. Once he, rege- once he doesn't do it, reject it. Let's say that day of the Bar Mitzvah, he put on tefillin, right? They bought him tefillin. That's it. There's no more rejection. We saw that he acted like a Jew. He put on tefillin. That's it. Too late. So once he puts on tefillin, it's already too late to reject it. That's the idea, right? Yeah. What if it's a, yeah. one of those people that yeah. you feel out, a rabbi feels out, tests yeah. out, and you see that it's not a proper person to convert? You're talking about a kid or you're talking about an adult? No, a, uh, an adult. So you shouldn't take him. A Gentile. You shouldn't take him. But you take him anyway. You should not. Okay, but yeah. let's say he, con- he or she convinces you. Right, they, they pulled pull the scam. They scammed you. Uh, well, scam, whatever. Do, does uh, a Jewish soul still in there? If they, if they scammed you, you know, they, 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 you know, they pulled the fast one on you, yeah. and you did everything kosher, yes. and they accepted the mitzvot, yes. there's no going back, no matter what. I see. You know what I mean? Wow. But, right, there's a special rule for these kinds of converts, the, the ones that you're mentioning. The ones that scammed, you know, pulled the scam, you know what we do to them? What we do to them is that we, like, ostracize them from the community. Mm-hmm. What is that? We tell people, you know, like, don't marry this guy. Don't marry this lady. I see. Because we suspect them that they converted not for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we wait for a while, a couple of years, you know, and we see, is he acting like a Jew, isn't not it, acting like a Jew? It, isn't it up to uh, Hashem, though, and his angels, whatever, to see through that person and uh, not let the soul enter? Into that yeah, no, the truth is you're acting, you're asking a very good question. Why doesn't Hashem, you know, step in, you know, and uh, yeah, because this person you know, <laughs> is a shady, right, right. doing a shady conversion. So, yeah, maybe he's, he wants you know, you know what the answer is that I'll tell you something very, very powerful. The answer is like this that's the truth is that the Torah, once it was given on, on Har Sinai, it's in the hands of the rabbis, it's not really in God's hands anymore. Okay. We have to decide now what to do. You know, who to accept, who not to accept, when to say something is allowed, when to say something is not allowed. But the soul comes from up there. Right, but it's our decision. We're the ones who decide. Yeah, you're you're converting someone, that's your job as a a rabbi. Right. But you're not putting the soul into that person. That's true, but it's like automatic function. You know, once I do it, it automatically comes. I see. see. You know what I mean? Whether they deserve it or not. Right. So that's one thing we have to understand. There's also another very powerful issue. You know know what it is? Sometimes people pull scams Mm -hmm. and they get in, they get in, not the proper way. But you know what happens? That's, that can also be sometimes helpful in the long run. What does that mean? Now the person is scamming. Yes. But 20 years down the road, he may Maybe. do teshuvah. Or uh, in the next lifetime, you know? In the next Gilgul, next so reincarnation. You're saying, so you're saying Ivanka Trump has a Jewish soul. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, the truth is, you know, regarding her, there was a whole discussion about that. Uh, yeah. Was it Jewish? Uh, the, the rabbi who converted her is like super modern guy, but he's like orthodox, but super modern. You know, like he's super modern. When I heard that the, the rabbanut in the end, in the Israel, they accepted the, the they conversion. Accepted. Yeah, they accepted it. There was some discussion about it. Okay, so if they accepted yeah. it, then... Right, but as we said, right, that she when you have a... Oh yeah, I'm sorry, look at the next president. <laughs> Listen, the family will have that aspiration. But that's not our worry now. The, the, the worry is that that retard in the basement doesn't. doesn't <laughs> because what you see happening now is nothing. What's about the time. Uh, so let me tell you something interesting regarding that, right? So what we do is like this: when you have a conversion like this, which is a questionable, you know, not so hundred percent kosher, as we said, right? We, we we put that person to the side, and we tell people to like not to not to marry them. We wait and we see how they behave, you know. Are they doing Jewish life? Are they doing Jewish customs? You know, are they behaving like a Jew? If we see that they're not, as we said, right, there's no going back. You cannot make them into a boy again. I noticed that a lot yeah. of the Gomis, yeah. uh, and I, I'm a movie buff, so I look up actors a lot. And, you know, a lot of them, not a lot, a lot, but 
many of them had converted for the for the love of marriage. Yeah, yes, yes, marriage. yes, yes. Uh, do you know John King from CNN? He converted for Dana Bash, but then he divorced her. But he's still a Jew. Yes, he, yes, he yes, yes. Uh, some actors converted. Yeah, you know, Marilyn Monroe converted, you know, oh, Elizabeth Taylor, know she, yeah, Elizabeth know Taylor, she, you know, yeah, know they were converts, yeah, they converted, yeah. Yeah. To, marry, to marry Jewish men, this is the reason why. Uh, Sammy Davis converted because he was saved by a Jew at one time. <laughs> <laughs> I think he did, a, I think he did reform though, he didn't do Orthodox. Right. Sammy Davis, so Sammy. He, so he has a reform soul <laughs> coming from uh, <laughs> Reform still, that's very interesting what you're saying. But what we do is like this, right? We wait, that person, we watch him. You know? There's no going back. We already did the conversion. Yeah. But well, what we do is, it, what we do is, like, the Ramam says like this, even though we cannot go back and make him into a goy, mm -hmm. but what we do is, if we, if we see that he's not acting like a Jew, we like, kind of like, you know, push him out. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, we stay away from him. But I'm assuming if a Jew converts to a boy, there is a yeah. coming back. There is no conversion to a good. No such a thing like no, that. You know what I mean? Technically speaking, there's yeah, no conversion. Yeah. Right? So that's a different name. It's not called conversion. That's become you became shmad, you know, you became uh, uh, you're right, you became uh, you know you, you got know a lot of them have done it. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Many of them became popes in the end. <laughs> you know that, right? Many of the popes were Jewish. I didn't know. You know that, right? Yeah. Go go on history and you'll see. A lot of them were Jewish. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like you okay, let it go. All the best. We're almost finished. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, so, uh, as we said, goes on the Rambam. Also, another very interesting halacha is like this. Let's say a goy, right, before he converted, he was a sinner, you know? So he, he killed somebody, you know, or he committed adultery, you know, things like this. He stole he armed robbery, you know. He raped somebody, whatever. So what happens with these sins once a person converts? That's the question, right? So the Rambam says he's forgiven for everything. Once a person converts, he's forgiven for all his sins. Right? But he mentions something here, an interesting caveat, right? That's only if he killed a goy, or if he committed, he committed adultery with a goya. But if he did it to a Jew, he's not, he's not absolved from that, right? That's the idea. So therefore, he should be killed even after he converts. He killed a goy, and there has to be witnesses, well, obviously. Didn't you tell us yeah. in one of the seminars yeah. that there was really only one execution in, in Jewish history? Uh, we didn't say that, but what we said was that it's not supposed to be a frequent occurrence, execution. Right. Yeah. We're talking about like once in seven years, once in ten years, you know, something oh. like that. It shouldn't be something which is happening on a daily basis. Why is that? Because there's always, always loopholes to get them off, you know, so you should try to get them off. We're talking about Jewish law, yeah. right? It's a little bit different. Okay. So, uh, anyway, as we go on, right? So, um, you think that's where the Goisha courts uh, learn the appeals from, from us, the loopholes? Because we have the loopholes. Uh, well, our loopholes are a little bit different than theirs, oh. you know, but there are some similarities. Uh, yeah. There's always an overlap, you know, especially with American law, because American law was taken largely from, from, from the Torah. You know, those pilgrims, you know, Puritans, were very much into Bible, you know, so they yeah. took a lot of things yeah. from the Bible. Okay, so. Uh, Let's go on. So says the Rambam, besides those seven mitzvot, as we mentioned, that they're liable to death on these things, there's also other mitzvot that the goyim have, which are, they're not liable to death on them. They're prohibited to them, but they're not liable to death. Right? So he says, which one are they? So it says, right, that uh, we're talking about uh, grafting, grafting animals, you know, like a donkey with a horse, you know, to make a mule. They're not permitted to do that. And also grafting trees, right? With an apple tree, with a pear, you know, to make some kind of a new fruit. People do that, you know, right? So a goy is also forbidden to do these things. But says the Rambam, nevertheless, they're not liable to death on these things, right? It's just for, it's forbidden to them. It's a sin. Another thing which he mentions, right, which is well known, is that if a goy, you know, hits a Jew, right, and draws blood, makes a wound, you know, he's liable to death on that. But the earthly court does not kill him for that, right? What happens is in, in Shemaim, they will they may kill him. You know, they he may he may die because of that. He, he may, may be punished. No, it's not guaranteed. Well, you know, I cannot tell you. I don't know exactly how you know how how this yeah. this will work, but he's liable to death in Shemaim. Uh, the a yeah. guy who hits a Jew, right. you know, draws blood, makes a wound on him, you know, whatever. He broke his tooth. He broke broke his you know something. He broke a bone or he, he you know cut him you know with a knife. Even he if he didn't kill him. him. 
Yeah. Even if he didn't kill him, by the way. Right? That's, that's the rule. Right? Because a Jew is considered to be from the army of God, from the people of Hashem. So whoever touches them is liable to death. That's the so idea. they're not uh-huh. considered to be an army of, uh, of Hashem? The army of Satan, just the opposite, right? Okay, they're, they're from the side of Satan. That's what they are. That's where they come. Even well, the righteous ones. They are. They have no connection with Hashem. They're not connected to the side of holiness. Even the ones that are close, they're close. You know what I mean? They're almost there, but on the other side, you know? There's a border. You know, all, the only ones who are connected to Hashem from the right side is the Jewish people. All the other ones are not connected from the right side. They're connected from the back side, from the back door. Why is that? Because they rejected the Torah. That's the reason why. It was, it was their choice. What can we do? It's not, it has nothing to do with us. Okay, very good. Uh, another thing, right, which is interesting, the Rambam says about the Goyim, are the Goyim, right, the question is, are they obligated to do circumcision, right? Brit Milah. So the truth is that right, the Goyim are not obligated to do circumcision, but there is one group, the, the, right, the Chazal say, the sages say, they're obligated to circumcise. You know who that is? The Bene Keturah. Who is the Bene Keturah? These were the concubines, the sons of the concubine of Abraham Avinu, Keturah, that was, he had five sons that were born from them. Those were commanded to do circumcision with the family of Amar Aminu, so therefore they're obligated to do. So the question is now today, how do we know who's from Keturah? Right? How do we know who's that? Is this nation, that nation, right? Is it Saudi Arabia? Is it uh, Jordan? I don't know who it is, right? Uh, so what he says is like this, right? The Bnei Keturah, they're mixed up with the Bnei Ishmael, right? The Arabs, you know? So they're like one group, Muslims, you know, basically. All the Muslim nations, this is like from Bnei Keturah, Bnei Ishmael. That's where they come from. So therefore, they have to do Brit Milah. And they do, by the way. That's their custom. Right? They do. And according to the Chazal, they're commanded to do that. They have to, they have to do Brit Milah. Why is that? Because we have a doubt they may be from the Bnei Keturah, from the sons of Keturah. Because the Ishmael and Keturah, they're all mixed together. Muslims, you know? The Muslim countries. They're all mixed together. So therefore, they have to do Milah, right? The one thing that they do wrong, there are several things that they do wrong. But the one, one thing is they, they, do, they do it on the age of 13, right? But they have to do it at eight days, like we do. This is the real, the mitzvah, mitzvah is on eight days. After the child is born. Not like what they do when he becomes 13. This is a mistake what they do. Yeah. Uh, another thing which is a mistake, you know, which is they, they don't cut two layers of the foreskin. They only cut one layer. The second layer they don't cut, and it, and it gets rubbed off by itself eventually. But never, nevertheless, the, the milad, what, the way they do it is not the proper way. By the way, in Israel... A lot of the Arabs come to the Jewish mohel, you know, to do the milah. So the Jewish mohel will they do it the right way. The, the I, I'm sorry, they do at the age of thirteen, as we said, right? Yeah, they, yeah, they do. Yeah. A lot of them want, you know, want it done by a Jew, you know. So they come to the Jewish mohel, and they do it for them, you know. It's okay; they're allowed to do it, no problem, you know. I, I heard yeah. that they eat shellfish and they eat meat and dairy together. Yeah, they're not particular about. It. They don't yeah, eat pork. Okay. They don't eat pork. This is what they, what they're. Right. But this is something what they. Made from their own uh, volition, right? right? They're not forbidden to pork, really, to eat pork. It's an interesting idea. Oh, they're not forbidden? No goy is forbidden to eat pork, according to the laws of the Torah. No, I thought that yeah. they eat the long pork. That's their own, that's their own... Uh, no, not really, not really. The, the category is only regarding Brit Milah, right? The, the, the Muslims, the, the Arabs... I remember yeah, you, te- you yeah. were telling me when we were uh, yeah. young, um, they're the purest goy because they pray... God they're monotheistic, yeah. They're, they're monotheistic. Yeah, that's, this is what makes them uh, more uh, right, righteous, and the fact that they, they, they do brit milah also gives them some kind of a power, you know. But nevertheless, they're still on the side of the tumah. They're still on the side of satan. They're not on the side of the kedusha. They're not. Okay, very good. Uh, they're closer. That's the idea. You know what I mean? Close, but no cigar. <laughs> that's the idea. Okay, very good. Uh, Yeah. Let's go on in the Rambam a little bit more. But you're not allowed to marry. A Jew is not allowed to marry a Muslim. That's for sure. Uh, so right here we have also another thing which is forbidden to the Goyim. One of the most important things that Goy has to know, right? He's not allowed to study Torah. The Goy is not allowed to study Torah. So when we say that he's not allowed to study Torah, what does that mean? He's liable to death on that, by the way. Not by the earthly court, by, by heaven. Yeah, you told you know? us. That. Yeah, that's, he's liable to death on the heavenly court. So we have to warn them the Goyim, don't study Torah. What does that mean? Don't study Talmud, you know? There's a picture I saw one time, you know, the, the president, you know, the George W. Mm-hmm. He had like a big Gemara in his hand, you know? He was studying Talmud, you know? Yeah. Like these English translations. He liked it, you know? Also Obama, you know, I heard. He likes yeah, it. The, they the like Talmud, it. The Talmud has some terrible things to a say. Lot, r- right, right. But that, there's a lot of wisdom in there, you know, which they like to, they like to dabble in that, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Especially the Americans. The Americans are closer, you know, as we said, right? 
they're not so far away like the Europeans. The Europeans are like totally lost. Yeah. You know I mean, they're totally gone. But the Americans are still, you know, not that far. You know, yeah. you know, they're closer. You know, right? They're not exactly a big prize, but uh, you know, right. that's the idea. So, but but the point is like this, right? That a guy who carries around his gemara like that, you know, says gemara, he's liable to death on that. So we have to, we have to, we have to tell tell him that, you know, straight straight out. Excuse me, but is you shouldn't be studying. A, a little too harsh. It's from God. What can we do? We cannot change the laws of God. You know, what are we gonna do? We're gonna argue with God. You know, tell him, oh, it's too harsh, God. No, but to why be, don't you change it? To be, to be <laughs> right? executed because you're stuck. Not executed. We said right. It's not executed, but Hashem will may, may kill him. That's that, that's the um, something else, right? From Shemaim, they're liable to death on it. That's the idea, right? So then, right, but there's a contradiction. Why? Because in the Gemara it says that God who studies Torah is considered to be holy like the high priest. Oh, right? So then well, how do we reconcile the contradiction? So the Gemara says the recon- reconciliation is like this. They're allowed to study Torah. There are seven mitzvot. That, whatever we learned tonight, right, that they're allowed to study. But our mitzvot, they're not allowed to study. That's the difference, right? Their mitzvot, they can study. So this part of the Rambam, they can study. It's okay for them. And this Gemara also. Where did the Gemara come from, these Rambams? Most of them from Masechet Sanhedrin. Yes. Tractate Sanhedrin. That's where it comes from. Over there, the Arba Mitot, Perk Arba Mitot, they're allowed to study that. When it comes to, uh, uh, when it comes to other Torah, they're not allowed to study that Torah. You understand? Why is that? Because then since they rejected it, the Lord Baruch Hu told them, this is not yours anymore. You know, it belongs to the Jews. Sure. It's, it's, a, it's a covenant between me and the Jewish people, right? Torah Tzibalan Moshe, Moshe, Morashla Kile Kilat Yaakov. Right? That's what it says. What does that mean? That it's it's an inheritance for the sons of Yaakov, for the Jacob, right? For the sons of Jacob, the twelve tribes. Okay, very good. So therefore, right, the person has to be careful about that. There's also another thing which makes a goy liable to death if he keeps some, one of the mitzvot of the Torah. You know what that is? Keeping Shabbat, right? They're not allowed to keep Shabbat, the goy. Why? Because this is also something between right, Beni Uben Beni Israel. It's only between God and the Jewish people. The special gift that Kadosh Baruch gave to the Jewish people. Unfortunately, a lot of them are, are not using that gift, right? They're throwing it in the, in the, in the, right, in the closet somewhere, right? uh, unfortunately. But Shabbat is considered to be a gift between God and the Jewish people, a great, great holy gift. So therefore, right, a goy is not allowed to keep Shabbat. So the truth is, you know, that one of my friends once, once asked me, you know, they were not Jewish at that time. Now they converted already. But they asked me, you know, as a goy, like, you know, am I allowed to, am I allowed to keep any, any Shabbat or, all, or, not, or some parts of it or... What's the rule, you know? So I wasn't really sure, to be honest with you. So after I looked in the Gemara and the Rambam, what I found was that what they're not allowed to keep, also Rashi, right? There's a Rashi there. They're, they're not allowed to keep totally Shabbat. To- 100%, like, you know, like we should keep. They're allowed to keep it like 90%. What does that mean? They should do something to break Shabbat. You know, like take a drive, you know, drive, buy, buy some ice cream, you know, get some ice cream on Shabbat, this you know. Is right? Or no, this is from the Torah. They're liable to death on that. You know what I mean? If they keep fully Shabbat. You understand? So therefore, they should do something to break it. They're allowed to make kiddush, let's say, right? Make kiddush, have the meals on Shabbat, keep most of it, you know, and then 10%, you know, break something, you know, you know something to show that you're not 100% there. If you want to be 100% there, convert, you know, that's, uh, that's the option that you have. And then you can keep all of it. That's the idea, right? So Goy has to show that he's breaking somehow Shabbat, you know, some way. You know, turn on some lights, uh, you know, start a, you know, smoke a cigarette, do something to show that you don't keep Shabbat. That's the idea, right? That's the way it works. Okay, very good. Some, unfortunately, some Jewish, some Jews seem to think in our generation that they have to be like a goy, you know? Break some Shabbat. <laughs> it shouldn't be like that. <laughs> You're getting the wrong religion. <laughs> okay. So, but the other thing is, like, also on the other side, I was also asked by, you know, several people, so then what is a goy allowed to keep? Let's say a goy wants to keep a certain part of the mitzvot or the Torah. Is he allowed to keep them? You know, let's say he wants to keep Hanukkah, you know, light Hanukkah candles. Let's say he wants to put on tefillin. Let's, let's say he wants to keep kosher, right? Buy only empire, you know, empire uh, chicken, right? Turkey. Is he allowed to do that? So the truth is, right, the Rambam says he's allowed to do it. What does that mean? Besides the mitzvah of Shabbat and learning Torah, they're allowed to keep all the mitzvot if they want. Whatever they want to keep, they can keep. Except one thing they have to know, right? They shouldn't make a new religion. What does that mean? They should keep it the way we keep it. If they want to keep the mitzvot of the Torah, do it the way we do. Don't do it some like new way now, you know? Some newfangled thing. Like, you know, somebody, uh, one of my friends just told me, right? Now they mean like a new thing, you know, the, you know, the uh, BLM, you know, those guys, you know, the, the people like that, right? What do they do? It's a new, new fashion now, right? 
like we do, you know, we celebrate Pesach because we were liberated from slavery, you know, so they also want to do that, to show they were liberated from slavery, you know, so what they do is they have a different time that they want to do Pesach. When is that? On that day, right, when they were liberated from slavery? It was just passed now, right? What is that, what they call that day? 19th, whatever, 19th, whatever it's called, right, whatever. So they want to do the Pesach customs on that day. You know, like, eat matzot, you know, and this kind of, <laughs> kinds of things like this. But we have to tell them, right, that no, you're making a new religion. If you want to keep Pesach, keep, keep it on the day of Pesach, like we do. Don't make a new religion and do it on a different, some different day. You know, some new fangled idea. So if they want to keep the religion of the Jewish people, they have to keep it the way we keep it. That's the idea, you know what I mean? Not to make their own rules and their own customs, you know, and some odd things and, you know, things and things, add all kinds of things. So if a, if, a, if a Dan Jew wants to keep the laws of the Torah, except Shabbat totally, as we said, and learning the Torah, they're allowed to do so. And also there's another thing, right, which we have to know. It's very simple, right? Very, 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 uh, uh, very clear, clear cut. That if a, if a, Jew, if a non-Jew wants to study the Bible, with no commentary, just say, right? Just to know the words, you know, to know the words, what they mean, and to read the Bible. He's allowed to read the Bible. How do we know that, by the way? Because it says in the Torah that Kadosh Baruch commanded Moshe Rabbeinu to write the Torah in 70 languages in order that all the going should be able to read the Torah. So what does that mean? The written Torah, which is the Chumash in the Bible, the 24 books of the Bible, a Goy is allowed to read that without, without any like deep commentary. What does that mean? Because some of the commentary comes from the oral Torah the Midrashim, the Talmud, all kinds of things like this, that they're not allowed to, to read because that's the oral Torah. So the rule is like this, right? Oral Torah, they're not allowed to read. What does that mean? Talmud, Midrash, right? The Rambam, you know, Shulchan Aruch, things like this. This is the oral Torah. They're not allowed to read that. But when it comes to the written Torah, the Bible, they're allowed to read, uh, read the written Torah. This is the difference, right? They have no prohibition about that. So there's all kinds of nuances here, right, that a person has to understand. Also, another thing which is very interesting is that... Um, a goy, right, let's say he wants to do additional mitzvot, as we said, right, he's allowed to do all the mitzvot of the Torah, except Shabbat, totally, and also uh, to, to learn Torah. So, how is he going to do it if he doesn't know how to do it? So, therefore, he should, he's allowed to study or ask somebody how to keep this mitzvah. How do I put tefillin? How do I do this, right? They're allowed to do that. Why? Because if they want to keep these mitzvot, they're allowed to. So, therefore, if they want to keep them, we cannot stop them, tell them, no, don't keep these mitzvot. Let them do if they want. And they shouldn't be afraid, you know, and say, oh, they're making their own religion, you know. Only, we're only afraid if they're making their religion. Why? How? How? If they're doing it the way that they want to do it, not the way that we do it. So then it's like making a new religion. But if they want to do it the way we do it, we allow them to do that. So therefore, most of the mitzvot, as we said, they're allowed to keep. No problem with that if they want to keep. A lot of them, by the way, today, it's a big fad. You know, they want to be, they call themselves Noahides, right, these people. What does that mean? Noahides. Right, Noahides. What does that mean? They want to keep, like, to be, keep the seven mitzvot and then do also some Jewish customs. So therefore, right, if they want to do that, this is, this, these are the guidelines that we just mentioned that in order they shouldn't get into trouble, you know? They have to know where the I rules, mean, where the borders are, you know? I mean, Not really, because, you know, because being a Noahide means, you know, you want to keep the seven mitzvot. It's much easier, you know? Not everybody wants to go all the way, you know, and keep 630 mitzvot and be punished also if he doesn't keep them. Because the goy is not punished if he doesn't keep these things. You know what I mean? He doesn't keep Shabbat. Who's going to punish him? Yeah. You know what I mean? So therefore, right, because there's still a lot of room to be a Noahide. No problem with that. But you have to do it the right way, right? Not the way that you think is right. The way the, the rabbis, no, our tradition still, is. Still a Gentile. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Noahide is a Gentile until he converts totally, right? Uh, absolutely converts. That's something else. But until he has converted, come to the point of conversion... I'll tell you something else, and we'll stop here, right? Something so very interesting. That, no, a couple of guys texted me on YouTube that I'm a yeah. Noahide, whatever. So Noahide yes, is yes. still devoted to Yeshua? No, no, they don't, they don't, do, they don't do that. Oh, they don't do they that. gave up idolatry. Oh, I right? see. So they want to just keep the seven mitzvot, like, you know, we, like, like, in other words, the way, the way that we instructed. That, that's what they want to keep. You understand? They gave up on the church. They know that it's all a big sham, right? The biggest sham in history, by the way. You know, the... Trump, right, says the biggest sham was the Russia, you know, investigation. The biggest sham is, is Christianity. That's the biggest sham that there ever was. It's all t total lie. Yes, you will forgive me for everything. Who's going to forgive you? What, are you kidding me? God will judge you for everything. Who's going to forgive you? If you, do, if you do a repent, that's something else. You repent, that's a different story. You repent, you, tell, you say to God, I'm sorry, you know, I sinned. Nobody saw you, let's say. There was no witnesses. You want to repent? Very, very good. You should repent. But if you think that today you're going to, the night you're going to sin, tomorrow, yes, you will forgive you in the morning, and you can keep on going, doing this all your life like this. You're, you're making a joke out of religion. You're making a joke out of yourself, right? That's the idea. You know, the person has to know what uh, what the, what the rules are. It's well, heresy, you know. It's a total heresy. Yeah. But I want to tell you one more thing. We'll finish here. Mm -hmm. An interesting case came out of this whole 
case study over here that we're talking about, which is that uh, a friend of mine when, you know, who converted to Judaism, before the conversion, right, there was a certain crime that occurred, you know, he was a victim of a crime, right? So what happened was that this crime was committed by somebody, and this person ran off, you know, and uh, they weren't able to catch this person. You know, this was in, in America. This was like 20, more than 25 years ago. So what happens is now, right, lo and behold, the police calls up this person, right, and tells him we caught the guy after 25 years. <laughs> How did they catch him? What did they do? They found DNA, you know? DNA test. They, they matched it up with somebody who was like a serial, you know, criminal sitting in jail for a long time. They found it. Fuck, you know? So now the state brings a case against him, the prosecutor, you know what I mean? And they want this person now to come and testify. Tell them what happened. You know what I mean? So comes this person and tells me a very strong question, a very powerful question. You know what the question is? Am I allowed to do this, to testify against this person? So I said, what's the question? So the question is like this, right? As we mentioned over here, that we mentioned it, I don't know if you caught it, but circumstantial evidence is not admissible when it comes to capital cases especially. So DNA is not admissible according to Torah law. Not admissible. There has to be witnesses. Even though it's 100%, like whatever, you want to call it 100%, whatever it is, you have to have witnesses. Yeah. So the thing is like this, right? They match up DNA. There's no witnesses. So you know the problem is? That person who was a victim of the crime, he himself doesn't remember that person either. He doesn't remember how they looked anymore. It was 28 years ago. I see. I see. So the question is now, is are they allowed to go to court and testify, even though there won't be any witnesses, gonna be, he may be convicted yeah. on, 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 the, uh, on the circumstantial evidence of the DNA. Yeah. So when I heard this question, it almost knocked me out. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It was a knockout question. I had no answer for that. Unbelievable. So what happened, what happened was I researched it. I said to myself, my God, you know, this is not an easy question. I was thinking maybe I should go to some bigger rabbis, you know? Mm. And ask this question because I had no idea even how to start with this question. So the truth is, you know, that after researching it for several hours, I found the answer. You know, because the, the truth is that there's a, lot, there's a lot at stake over here. If, you, if they convict that person, he can go to jail for 15 years, you know. And you wrongly convicted him because you don't have any testimony. Yeah. This is not allowed to do. Mm-hmm. Miscarriage of justice, apparently. You know what I mean? So how can you do such a thing like that? This was the question, you know, something scary. You don't want to do that to anybody, you know what I mean? Whether he's Jewish or not Jewish, what difference does it make? Miscarriage of justice like that. So, you know, after looking around, I found the answer to the question. My gut feeling was that she should go to testify. I didn't have a source, you know, but then I found. So where's the source? There's several sources, but there's a true of the Rashba, you know, one of the great earlier authorities, the Rashba. He writes in his uh, responses, it's Siman Shin Men Hei in the, in the new, new responses of the Rashba. Shin Men Hei, 345. He has a long essay over there that he regard, writes regarding criminal activity, all kinds of criminal enterprises, you know, whatever. So he writes something interesting there, you know, which is also, by the way, brought down in the Bet Yosef, it's brought down in the Shulchanur, this concept. The concept is like this that the government or the king, right, whatever, the leaders of the country, they have a right to do something, to take like a, a a preventive measure in order to in order to prevent crime to scare people from from sinning mm-hmm. from from committing crimes so what does that mean they're allowed to punish even with no witnesses in order to 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 right uh, to have deterrent to deter people from sinning from from committing crimes to scare them you know otherwise we, there'll be anarchy you know like we have today we have anarchy today right you know you know go go and see the videos what ha- what happened over there right and also what's happening in Seattle over there, right? People are getting raped over there, shot. What do you think God will do about this? Huh? What's going on? I'm sorry? What do you think God will do about what's going on? What can I tell you, you know? It is what it is, you know? I mean, I, 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 don't, I cannot tell you prophecy, but what's the interesting thing? I think it's right. That uh, says the Rashba over there, that in a case like this, we don't really need uh, testimony. Mm. What does that mean? It's like a, it's a preventive measure in order to prevent criminal activity. 
criminal behavior. So therefore, says the Rashba, in a case like this, whether it's a Jewish court or a non-Jewish court, they're allowed to kill on circumstantial evidence because in order to deter crime. This is exactly the category that we're talking about. Wow. Understand? So therefore, governments do have a power to do that. Every state, you know, has a power to, to make to punish people even without witnesses if they, they need to need that to deter criminal behavior. Wow. You understand? So therefore what they do with the DNA, apparently, you know, in order to convict people like murderers and, and rapists and all kinds of things like this, armed robbers, you know, they have uh, they have what to rely on. You understand? And there are precedents, by the way, like this in Talmud, when the rabbis can punish people like this. Mm. You know, also they did like mass punishments, you know, like they killed like eighty people in one day. Even though usually usually we don't do that, we kill one by one. But in order to deter people from sinning, they did all kinds of like scary measures to scare them, to deter them. So therefore, you're allowed to do that. That's the, that's the idea. So therefore, I, I told this person, you know, you're allowed to go and testify because this guy, you know, if he gets out, yeah. he may he may do a more crime. He, he already killed somebody. You know what I mean? So he may kill now somebody else. This is the whole point of this of this you know measure that we want to deter criminal activity like this. He's a hardened criminal, you know? He's, he's already committed many crimes. And this is, by the way, the reason why, you know, we talked about this before, why execution is so important to have. You know why? Because people become serial criminals after a while, you know? If you don't get rid of them, they'll get rid of you, you know? Once they do it once, they'll do it again. They, it becomes a habit. Stu- there are studies, and yeah? not studies yeah. by rabbinical courts, yeah. but there are studies that uh, capital punishment doesn't deter that's a different issue. Yeah, that's a different issue. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is that capital punishment it it saves you from that person sitting committing another crime. Right. That, it yeah. saves society. Right. right. This is what I'm talking about. Right. You know what I mean? And these people can become usually like serial, you know, yeah. criminals. Yeah. They become they get used to it. You know. Sure. Sure. First arm robbery, then rape, then yeah. then murder, yeah. right? Then this, then that, then uh, you know, it becomes like a, a way of life, a lifestyle. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know. Yeah. And this, therefore, right, the, the, the best thing to do is to get rid of these people, you know, to, to eliminate them. Because that, that's nothing good will come from them. Mm-hmm. They need to be killed, executed, and come back. But unfortunately today, you know, in most places we don't have that penalty. It's funny. Yeah. My, uh, Alex, God bless him. So before you tell a story, I just want to let's say, right, we'll stop here. Sure, sure. Chazak Baruch, thanks for coming. Okay. And you should see only blessed and good things. No more anarchy, no more lawlessness, right, only... Uh, Living with the laws of the land and living right, the moral way, right? The Kadesh Baruch should bring us the, the good leaders that right, bring us to morality and to, to justice. Mm-hmm. That's the way it has to be. Otherwise, right, we're going to fall into anarchy. You know what it says in Pirkei Avot, right? Finish with this. It says in Pirkei Avot, right, that pray for the, for the peace of the government, for the, right, for their welfare. You know why? There was no government. People would each eat each other alive. That's yeah, what it says. what the government is allowing. Exactly. That's the idea. They'll eat each other alive when there's no government. Yeah. My uh, my ex boss who died from a heart attack. Huh? So we'll stop it here. We'll stop, we'll stop it here. You should be blessed and have a good evening. Amen. Amen. Okay, we'll stop here. And now we'll get to your story. I got.